There we go. Okay, so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about word to action. I want to say happy poetry month to everyone. I want to welcome Camille Dungy, who is our gracious guest. Um, thank you for agreeing to be with us, especially after a weekend of a fever. Um, I'd like to welcome the Word to Action alumni from 2020, the 2023 participants who will be joining me in Liechtenstein in, at the end of May, and everyone else who wants to hear about Word to Action and how we might change change the world with our words. My name is Kathy Whitmire, and I'm the host of Word to Action in Liechtenstein. I, we see climate changing all around us, and the question is, what is climate and what is our role in change? What is our role in climate action? Um, I wrote a little summary of what Word to Action is. You can read that on the website because just the other day, I heard an interview with Kava Akbar, and he was talking about revolutionary poetry. And what is the definition of revolutionary poetry? I like it so much better than any definition of eco poetry or what word to action is about. And he said, revolutionary poetry is poetry that does work. Work in the physics definition of work. And I'm an engineer, so I appreciate this. It's a force, the poem, acting on an object, the person, to create movement, action. So poems that do work are the poems we try and write, we try to write with word to action. Um, yeah, so we're about using scientific knowledge to generate poems to help others understand the concept of climate um, in different and important ways. Um, we welcome all poets who understand that when it comes to climate action, Poetry can help ask the questions so that together we can develop solutions. It's about motivating individual action for collective action. Um, so um, when I started, the idea for Word to Action actually came from Will McInerney, who's here. Um, <clears throat> Will was doing a podcast that I heard, and I and no, I heard him do uh, an interview with Swiss Peace a peace organization. And I was so moved with this concept of using spoken word um, to motivate change. And his change he was focusing on was male violence. Because if you can stem male violence, you can eventually have world peace. This was a brilliant concept. I reached out to Will. He introduced me to um, collaborative poetics. And he gave me this manual. Collaborative poetics is about, I call it thinking about the world through language. And it's about measuring the impact of art on the audience. And my question with Word to Action was how do we measure the audience's response? So the first time we did it with a reading, we tried to do a survey before and a survey after. It wasn't so good. So I'm going to share my screen with you quick and just show you what we do during the reading. So we have posters and little first and second graders have decorated my physical posters. And on one side of the poster, there's a fact about climate change and its impact. On the other side of the poster is something, some good someone is doing somewhere. And we have little emojis on the chairs of everyone in the audience, and they can raise the green heart to say they're moved, the teardrop to say they were saddened, or the flame to say they're fired up, meaning they're going to take action or they thought of an action they could take. Um, we're gonna ask you to put your reactions. You can put the words or the emojis in the chat, and then I will measure how you respond to everybody's poem and to the facts that I present in between the sections. So that's what that's about. And now to Camille Dungy, my honored guest. Um, Camille Dungy is the author of four collections of poetry. I have a few of them here. Um, and 
most recently Trophic Cascade, which I think most of us have read. Uh, she's the winner of the Colorado Book Award. She is also the author of the essay collection, Soil, the story of a black mother's garden that's coming out this year. Mine is on pre-order. Um, and guidebook to relative strangers, journeys into race, motherhood and history. She is a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award, or that book was, sorry. She has also edited anthologies, including Black Nature, Four Centuries of African-American Nature Poetry, and From the Fish House, an anthology of poems that sing, rhyme, resound, syncopate, alliterate, and just plain sound great. She has so many awards, I'm afraid that if I go through them now, we won't have any time to hear her read. Um, she is a university distinguished professor at Colorado State University. Welcome, Camille. Hello. Um, hi. Can I also put a nod to your immaterial podcast for the Met? Please. I love that podcast and I love Shells. I've listened to it at least twice now, maybe three times. Oh. Um, it's a beautiful podcast for a long walk, um, especially on a, a rainy day when there's not much too much fog to see very far. I love that podcast. I really enjoyed working on it. And I and I particularly love that the opening of that episode with that long cont call at the beginning. That makes me really happy. <laughs> I'm glad you like it. Yeah, thank you. Um, so first I'm gonna ask you a question. And I had a few, but I love to use your poem, Characteristics of Life, as a prompt. Um, I also use others, but what I do is I hand out issues of science and nature to get people writing about scientific facts. And do I have to put facts in quotes because we're in a weird place in our understanding of what is truth? Um, Science is the search for truth, not the possession of it. So my question is, should the eco-poet approach their poetry with the same humility as a scientist in interrogating the current state of things? So Socrates said, I don't know what I don't know. And I think that humility means we can't state things that we're not certain of yet. And I'm not doubting science. I think we need to use science to move on to know more. Is that clear? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that is clear, but I think that there are a lot of things that we do know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, right? I mean, there are a lot of things that we do know and that we have been knowing. And in a way, if the, if the information changes, it's a matter of scale. It's because it's quite often, it's because it's a greater um, issue than it had been um, five or 10 or 15 years ago when it was spoken about last. Um, so that the scale shifts doesn't mean the facts change. <laughs> um, it simply means that the urgency may um, be different. Um, there's no way we can ever have a point where the facts are stable. Um, I mean, I like to talk about this in the sense like our years are um, getting, they change, right? Like every year, the moon moves a little bit farther away from the earth, which changes the rotation of the earth, which changes the length of our years, right? Um, and our days. So, I mean, that's a fact. It is in fact a fact that our days are like 24 point something something seconds, but it's also a fact that that, that point something something shifts and shifts. But that doesn't mean that the fundamental fact of 24 hours isn't true and won't be true for a really long time. I mean, we can operate off of that, right? Um, and so I, I just don't, I don't quite understand the hesitancy to work with the facts as we have them, when we have them. 
and being open to shifting and changing when the, when when the information shifts and changes that's also very very important right so so our our knowledge about um our knowledge about gender since we're like right here so close to trans visibility day right our knowledge about gender is different than it was when a lot of those facts were set down those facts i'm going to put in air quotes right with those facts were set down in 19th century um science like we have different information <laughs> so we can shift our ideas about gender expression in humans um and also uh relationship alignments etc cetera, etc cetera, because we have different information right so i don't feel beholden to facts in the sense that i have to be rigid and unopen to true change um, and fundamental change, particularly fundamental change that allows us to be better people um, and in better relationships with others. Um, but I also feel like the the knowledge that a hardworking, um, careful, um, conscientious and moral <laughs> scientists um, are producing, I'm fine using that as my base point. Yeah, and I think that's what you're addressing exactly what I was hoping you would, and that is that we as poets approach with a scientific humility. And by that, I mean, we know there's more to learn. And, and when we honor old poets, we have to recognize that times have changed and probably put a lens on things. Very nice, thank you. Would you like to ask any questions about word to action or do you want to start reading? I'd love to know. Um, you know, I think I'd like to know why you believe, I do, um, but why you believe that poetry um can be a means towards this kind of revolutionary uh work thank you because it moves me and other people's poems move me and i would hope we can move others and i know so many people don't get poetry my husband is one of those unfortunate persons um but it can move people. And if we can just, when you get inside someone and you do, you create a force on a person, you can get them thinking. And maybe we do that here. Maybe we don't. We're trying to measure that. And that's what collaborative poetics is about. But I have faith because I've been moved by other people's words, including yours. So thank you. Well, that's also so interesting, Kathy, because you say it doesn't necessarily work for your husband. And, and honestly, even though I do believe in the power of poetry, not all poetry moves me, right? Mm -hmm. Like, um, and so the, I don't believe that, um, there can't be one, just one solution, right? Um, so I love, I love communities that allow multiple solutions and and bring art into into the equation as one of the possible um both solutions and <coughs> sorry um and um Oh, a solution is a little too, it's a little too fi final, right? Like we're gonna have poems and it'll be solved. Um, and so that's not really the right word. Pardon me a little bit today with my uh, extempor extemporaneous speaking. Um, if you didn't hear in the beginning, I have, I have been four hours free of a pretty severe fever. Um, so I think my my brain's a little bit fried. <laughs> but um, but I feel like part of the network, maybe that would be a better word um, for uh, change makers, right? Poets and artists can be part of the network of change makers. That would be what I would want to say. Thank you. If I could, it's like we could edit out all that <laughs> no prattle way. in the in-between. No prattle. Um, and if I could just tell you about something that's going on in Liechtenstein, um, 
they're doing 17 weeks to focus on the 17 sustainable development goals of the UN. And I am working on participating in that with um, students to of all ages to draft poems together, science-based poems, and that we perform and they built a huge 35 meter tower out of wood that they cultivated from a local forest to make it more biodiverse. They were moving um, fichte from the forest to plant more uh, diverse trees. And they built this tower to educate people about the SDGs. And I think it's a wonderful project and maybe we can insert some poetry in there. I think that that seems exactly the kind of place for poems to be. I That's think. a lovely idea. So can we hear from you? I would love to read some poems. Um, can I tell one last funny little story about this fever and then I'll let it go, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I feel like it's related to the question of facts, right? So it feels like this like, received fact that the average, that, that the human body temperature, the normal human body temperature is 98.6, but that's an average. And it's an average set again, based on some 19th century science with a really sort of like, not necessarily particularly um, sound. <laughs> Um, research base, right? Um, so I really suggest that all of you um, find out what your base temperature is, because um, it's not, it may not be 98.6. Mine is much lower than that. Um, and so like, when I finally was like 97.7, we're back, right? Like, I would not know, right? If I didn't know what my base temperature was, I wouldn't know that um, that what I'm aiming for personally for my set point is very different than what that um, other number is. So those are the times in which facts become useful as a guide, but not as a prescriptive. Um, and that is another way that I feel like poetry, is, is a necessary tool in this network of change makers because poetry opens us up to alternative ways of seeing and alternative ways of knowing, even as the poem, right? I'm not trying to say that thing like a poem can mean anything because I don't think poems can and should mean anything, but I think that a poem can mean in multiple ways simultaneously. Um, and that, is an exciting thing about a poem, um, just as like we can have multiple set temperature, body temperatures around the same general area simultaneously, right? Like I think poetry, being able to be open to poetry gives us this ability to think more capaciously. Um, and uh, we need that, right? We need that if we're going to, create the sustainable climate <laughs> um, and sustainable world to hold a lot of living beings, right? Not just humans, but a lot of living beings who have different set points and different needs and different demands um, that this planet for a very, very long time was able to sustain. And human interests, a very particular kind of capitalistic human interest, um, has made that close to impossible, right? We're getting very close to impossible. Um, so the, the uh, allowing the poetic mind um, to enter into the conversation, the mind that can hold more realities at once just feels to me like part, part of the way forward. So to that point, I will read the poem that Kathy mentioned, Characteristics of Life. And, and if I, I thought I had it marked. Yes, you can talk I, while I'm finding it. Okay, <laughs> real quick. If you could all remember to react with your heart, tear or flame after each poem, we'll get some data. 
Thank you. In the chat. Um, characteristics of life. A fifth of animals without backbones could be at risk of extinction, say scientists. BBC Nature News. Ask me if I speak for the snail and I will tell you, I speak for the snail. I speak of underneathedness and the welcome of mosses, of life that springs up, little lives that pull back and wait for a moment. I speak for the damselfly, water skeet, mollusk, the caterpillar, the beetle, the spider, the ant. I speak from the time before spinelessness was frowned upon. Ask me if I speak for the moon jelly. I will tell you one thing today and another tomorrow, and I will be as consistent as anything alive on this earth. I move as the currents move with the breezes. What part of your nature drives you? You in your cubicle ought to understand me. I filter and filter and filter all day. Ask me if I speak for the Nautilus and I will be silent as the Nautilus shell on a shelf. I can be beautiful and useless if that's all you know to ask of me. Ask me what I know of longing and I will speak of distances between meadows of night blooming flowers. I will speak the impossible hope of the firefly. You, with a candle burning and only one chair at your table, must understand such wordless desire. To say it is mindless is missing the point. That's beautiful. How are you holding up? Fine, thank you. I wrote that poem. I wrote that poem in conversation with two other poets, um, two other really re remarkable poets. Um, I was reading a book by Eva Salidas, um, "Many Ways to Say It." Was the book? She she was a phenomenal poet who we lost in that 2016 year when we lost also C.D. Wright and David Bowie and Prince. It's like all of those people went knowing something. <laughs> um, but uh, Eva wrote this poem, A Naturalist Prayer. Um, and I thought, oh, that poem, um, that poem sounds uh, like it may be in conversation with Ilya Kaminsky's po poem, The Author's Prayer. And I went and I read Kaminsky's poem and it was definitely, um, in conversation and I was like, I wanna get in on that chat. Uh, and I had just read that BBC news article and was trying to figure out what to do with that information. My daughter was very, very young, like, uh, you know, four months old or something like that, super young. And I was like, what have I brought this person into? Um, and I was up at night um, uh, with that worry and the invitation to enter that conversation with those other poets um, opened up that pathway for me. And so I find it really lovely, Kathy, to hear that you too offer my poem um, as an invitation to, to new poets, because I think that that's it, right? Like we have to be in conversation um, and we have to be moving towards um, creating sustainable sorts of actions and efforts together. This can't be a solo act. Um, so this next poem I want to read, uh, it, it's in Soil, the story of a Black mother's garden, which um, a month, this, it's like a month from its due date today, um, May 2nd, it's due. Um, though you can pre-order it now. Uh, and though it is a prose narrative, a book length narrative, I snuck in poems. Um, and I also snuck in um, images and photographs 
um, with which my daughter and a friend and another um, female artist all made together. And so there's like this kind of communal act there too with the with the images. But um, but I wanted some poems too because poems are important. <laughs> and here's one that that also talks about collaboration and Kathy ahead of time sent a question like, what's my idea of the word climate? Like, what do I think about when I think about climate? And um, I had that scientific concept of climate as like, not just the weather, but a sort of long-term um, condition of the atmosphere, right? Um, that was not a particularly scientific definition, but it's a, it's a longer term question of temperature and uh, wind patterns and currents and um, um, how all those things over time and space affect us. Um, so I understand that, but I also understand climate in a, in a metaphorical sense in terms of like, how we create um, cultural and political and um, uh, inner interpersonal uh, relation um, with each other and for each other, but that on a, again on a larger scale, right? So not just like how I talk to my neighbors, but like how I talk to my neighbors on a sort of uh, nationwide or global scale. And so this poem. Um, plays with both <laughs> of those ideas about how we think about the climates around us. In her mostly white town, an hour from Rocky Mountain National Park, a black poet considers centuries of protest against racialized violence. Two miles into the sky, the snow builds a mountain unto herself, unto itself. Some drifts can be 30 feet high. Picture a house, then bury it. Plows come from both ends of the road, foot by foot, month by month. This year, they didn't meet in the middle until mid-June. Maybe I'm not expressing this well. Every year, snow erases the highest road. We must start near the bottom and plow toward each other again. I have a box of the books downstairs and I haven't opened them yet. I think because I knew I was getting sick and I wanted to open them when I was well, but also I'm reading that poem and I realized like it was typeset wrong and doesn't have the stanza breaks where it's supposed to. And I, I know I'm also not opening it because I'm afraid they didn't make all the changes I wanted them to make. But you guys, we're going to have good energy, right? I'm going to open it later today and they're going to have made all the changes and that's going to be the four by four poem it's supposed to be, right? Okay. All right. Thank you. All that energy I can feel like you're like fixing anything in that box that needs fixing. Kathy, you want to ask me a question and let me rest my voice for a second and then um, and then I'll do a little bit more reading. Is that fair? You know what we could do? We could do an information screen and awesome. get just I'm just going to be quiet and let people read the. And then if you could react to these in the chat. Yeah, I, I read nature and science. I'm always behind, I have a stack, but um, 
Today I read the, about the oxygen levels decreasing along coasts so significantly it's affecting all fish and predator populations. And it's, you can't, it, like when we talk about the 17 SDGs, most of them link to climate. You know, SDG 13 is climate action and so many other ones, everything from conflict and peace to biodiversity, um, to energy, they all, innovation, they, they all have something to do with climate. They touch on that subject. And there are so many good things. That's the other thing I wanna say, reading nature and science. There's so much innovation happening, so much good in the world and people doing things. And I wanna keep my hope because it can get very um, sad and hard to look at your kids and say, I'm leaving you with this. Um, but they are our hope at the same time. There are people our age doing wonderful things. And um, my daughter invented a car that would um, run on garbage that it picks up along the road as it goes um, when she was five. And she had drawings and everything. And I said, you know, maybe, maybe. Um, Hopefully there wouldn't be that much garbage, but. I, I um, know. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, I think I'm ready again. Good. Um, and that's, those um, infographics were a good tie-in. I'm gonna read um, the title poem from Smith Blue. <clears throat> and, um, just thinking about into action, apparently um, the, the butterfly at the center of this is one of the one of the impetuses for one of the first really big citizen science organizations about butterfly counts and um, ways of keeping um, pollinator populations safe. So um, there's there there are happy endings that sometimes it's like a it takes longer than we necessarily want but I write about in soil how peaceful and sustainable revolutions actually aren't usually overnight um, and it's important to remember that the blue one will live to see the caterpillar rut everything they walk on that caterpillar was a capital C caterpillar. <laughs> Sea cliff buckwheat cleared, relentless ice plant to replace it. The wild fields bisected by the scenic highway, canyons covered with cul-de-sacs, gas stations, comfortable homes. The whole habitat along this coastal stretch endangered, everything, everyone, everywhere in it in danger as well. But now they're logging yeah, their one, their one, Maybe Kathy, if oh, you mute. Maybe Kathy, if you mute. Um, but now, um, but now, that's so weird. I have an so echo. Weird. I have an echo. I don't know where it's Becky, going. Becky, can you mute? I Becky, think it's you. Mute, I think it's you. Mm. Oh, I think it's you. I wonder. Wonder. Um, yeah. Um, still. Okay. Yeah. Wait. What if I? Okay. Wait. What if I? Is that? Can you hear me? Is that? Can you hear me? No? Okay. That's fine. I just turned okay. down the. It's fine. I just turned down the. All right. <laughs> but now they're logging the one still in the one site. The conspiring grasses. Conspiring grasses. Conspiring grasses. The Coriopsis matonis boots barely spare. And netted. And a solitary. Netted. A solitary Smith ahead of him chasing. Smith ahead of him chasing. Matoni wonders if he plans to swim again. Matoni, just like that, planned. the spell breaks. It's years later. Matoni lecturing on his struggling butterfly. How fragile. If his daughter spooled out the fabric she's chosen for her wedding gown, raw taffeta burled a bright hued tan. Perhaps Matoni would remember how those dunes looked from a distance, the fabric balanced between her arms, making valleys in the valley. 
the fan above her mimicking the breeze. He and his friend loved everything softly undulating under the coyest wind. And the rough truth as they walked through the land scratched and scrambled, and no one was there then besides Matoni and his friend walking along Dolan's Creek in that part of California they hated to share. The ocean, a mile or so off, anything but passive, so that even there, in the canyon, they sometimes heard it smack and pull well-braced rocks. The breeze, basic, salty, bitter, sour, sweet. Smith, trying to identify the scent, tearing leaves of manzanita, yelling, this is it, here, this is it. His hand to his nose, his eyes, having finally seen the source of his pleasure alive. In the lab, after the accident, he remembered it, the butterfly. How good a swimmer Smith had been, how rough the currents there at Half Moon Bay. His friend alone with reel and rod, Matoni back at school early that year, his summer finished too soon. Then all of them together in the sneaker wave and before that, the ridge, a congregation of pinking blossoms, and one of them bowing, scaring up the living, the frail and flighty beast too beautiful to never be pinned. Those nights, Matoni worked without his friend, he remembered too. He called the butterfly Smith's Blue. So crazy story about connection and network. I wrote that poem, scientific research, maybe a little bit of sociological research. Just read about the Smith's Blue Butterfly, was fascinated, really interested in the story of the friendship between um, Claude Smith and um, Ron Matoni um, and like made up this like story, this idea about one of their bug finding trips and then also like Matoni's long future, um, like imagining he had this daughter and all these things. I never imagined Smith had a family. I just thought that they were really young. Like, it just never occurred to me. I don't know if we can see it. Let's see, I just dropped everything. But there behind me in the back corner, you can't see it very well, but there's a family picture. That's Claude Smith and his family. And I, um, I got to know them because his granddaughter found the book on Amazon. It was like, this is a poem about my grandfather and um, came to a reading that I gave in California once. And um, we, we like stay in touch now. Facebook is good for some things. And, <laughs> um, and uh, I like stay connected. His wife, his wife at the time remarried a few times. Um, but then um, just passed away, I think, last year. And um, her wish was to have her ashes scattered out in Half Moon Bay. Um, and that happened. And the family informed me of that, et cetera. And so, like, I get, like, a little teary when I talk about this sometimes. But, like, when we're writing, when I'm writing, about these big questions about environmental degradation and habitat loss and um, species loss and, and sneaker waves. And I'm also writing about people, <laughs> like real people with real lives and real communities and real cares and real families. And, um, and this matters because they matter, right? <laughs> um, uh, and um, so I keep, the, I keep Claude Smith and his family picture in my office now to just remind me that this is not abstract. <laughs> I'm not writing about just like made up things. I'm writing about real lives um, and real lives that touch other people's lives. Um, and so that just feels important and worth saying. What do you think, Kathy? Do I have time for one more poem? 
I forgot. Do you need a pause? Or do you want to I can't you? hear you because I turned my volume down. I can only hear myself. Sorry. I was just okay. okay. I'm just gonna give me a thumbs up. <laughs> okay. I will do one more poem. And um Kathy asked for uh this poem Sanctuary. So I will read it. Um, it was published in Emergence Magazine. If you don't know that magazine, it's a really, really wonderful magazine thinking about a lot of these important questions. Sanctuary. The way she holds her huge limb forward, patient and expectant, while the slight man untethers the old prosthetic, a cage of metal, polyurethane, and canvas large enough that I could stand inside. Sweet elephant, waiting as the man sets aside the artificial leg, then turns back to the nylon sleeve that cups her nub, rolling that down like a lover or a mother removes underwear from a body they adore. That gently, that disinterested in causing harm. That dear elephant, steady all this time on her three remaining legs while the man strokes the nub of her mine blasted one. It's pucker scar, a forever wound that reminds me of the chest of a, man, of a woman who has refused reconstructive surgery after losing one breast to the scalpel. The scar like a nipple stretched into a grin. I want to compare the look of that nub to something you will understand, America. But there is no way to say it other than this. When she was seven months old, the elephant walked on a landmine. After that, some people wanted to kill her. How could she survive, doubled over and using her trunk as a crutch, leaning always on trees? Put her out of her misery, they said. But look where she landed instead. In this sanctuary, where every few months, as she continues to grow, some people redesign and gently while she waits, warm, gray, and patient, secure around her blasted nub, a new and sturdy leg. Thank you. I hope you can stay. Can you hear us? Now I can. Okay. Good. okay. Um, thank you so much for reading. Um, thank you. I hope you can stay for the rest of us. Um, I, will, I would like to. Thank you. I would like you to hear our, we're going to have readings from our alumni and in attendees. We'll start with Enda and then Will, Tess, myself, I'm technically an alum, and then our um, participants for this year, Jerry and Doug. I would also like to give a shout out to Kara Knickerbocker, who was a big support last time around, and Lindsay Lesby, who helps me a lot with um, promotional material. Um, so quick, we'll do a share screen again, and do another fact. And you can react to... Okay, so now we will start with Enda. Hello everybody, and thank you so much, Kathy, for having us all here. It's lovely to see familiar faces as well, like Tess and Jerry and Lou. Um, 
And thank you, Camille, because I thought that that reading was so moving. Thank you so much. Um, I hope you're not too exhausted. We're definitely all fired up. I know you are with your temperature and everything, but thank you so much. And um, I thought it was, yeah. I didn't get to introduce you. Oh, sorry. I thought you meant begin. <laughs> sorry. I was pausing, but I do want to say um, I made um, I made little blurbs for everyone. Enda Wiley is joining us from Dublin. And she has published six collections of poetry, which I have several of here, um, with Daughterless Press. She is a co-host of the podcast Books for Breakfast with her husband, the poet Peter Sir. She's a book reviewer, a poet mentor, and as the Irish Times recently said, Enda Wiley is a true poet. So... Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Sorry, I thought you meant just begin, but anyway, thank you. Um, and thanks to everyone who's here listening. Uh, it, it was such an interesting conversation. Um, I liked when Camille said to Kathy, well, you know, why do you think that words can can cause action and change? And for me, one of the reasons is, well, I think that po great poetry is empathetic and um, it puts you in touch with the world that we all move in and the people that we encounter and the animals and nature and climate. And so um, I was pleased when Kathy was in touch with us and she said that, um, yes, eco poems can be read tonight, but also love poems um, can also be included. And so um, I also liked when Kathy said tonight that poetry moves her. And a poem that I read um, when I was writing this next poem that I, I'm, I'm going to, to read for you is a short little poem um, from a troubadour poet. And a lot of the troubadour poets in the 11th, 12th, 13th century were women poets. So this poet is called uh, Beatrice of uh, Dia. And she wrote uh, this, this short little poem in 1175. So I'm going to cheat Kathy by reading the short little poem first. Um, and she says, she's talking about a man but it's not her husband. And so I love this. She said, my tender, beautiful cavalier, when will I have you for myself, for one night only, naked in your arms? If you could only take my husband's place and swear to me, you'll answer when I call and heed my desire. So Kathy was saying earlier, are we fired up by poetry? As soon as I read that short little poem, which speaks to us across the centuries, it feels so contemporary and alive and real to me. I think when you're passionate about the world you move in, you can definitely affect change. And so um, thinking of um, Beatrice, Countess of Dia, I'm jealous of her name. It would be lovely to be called that, wouldn't it? Um, I wrote this poem called Great Big Bed. And it's available in um, a really good anthology of love poems that came out in Ireland last year. It's called Romance Options, Love Poems for Today. Um, and every poet in it has one thing in common that they've loved, um, that they've been in love in some way in their life. So because I'm W, my surname, I'm always at the end of anthologies. So here we go, Great Big Bed. And there is climate in this as well. And I wanted the turbulence of climate to reflect the turbulence of of her love life. This great big bed makes me think of you. Not that I've ever lain a full long night with you before, but if I could, it would be here, would be now in this great big bed, the skylight overhead. Slant of hail, a blind of snow, the whole world fierce outside and us within Breathless in a storm of sheets, the high triple mattress, a royal test of love, our skin bruised by the pee of desire. But look, a small crack in the glass where weather is spurting in, O oh, cruel observer of what we're about. Sleet to freeze your eyelids, winds bitter sli slicing of our cheeks, and then so slowly how a single flake of snow can drop into your mouth and melt upon your tongue that is so busy in its own way melting over mine. Thank you, Enda. That was beautiful. And I just want to say the reason I say love poems are eco poems is because you can't you can't love someone without loving the earth that supports them. Mm -hmm. And yeah, 
Thank you, Enda. Very nice. Thank you. Um, next, we have, so if you could all react to Enda. Um, I'm going to share the screen one more time. We'll do another fact that you can react to. Thinking of Smith's Blue. So next up, we have Will McInerney. Will is a research officer at the London School of Economics Center for Women, Peace, and Security. He's an award-winning spoken word poet. He's the reason for a word to action. <laughs> um, he's a researcher and an educator. He has co-authored and edited two recent books, Innovations in Peace and Education Proxies, and Das Buch, das jedermann lesen sollte, in vier Schritten zum Feministen. This is the book every man must read. Um, I know some men who disagree, but I think every woman has to read it. Um, and Will, you can tell us if it's going to come out in English. And Will may hopefully be joined by Professor Hilary Kramer. Um, Will, do you want to take over the introduction? Yeah, wonderful. Thanks so much, Kathy. And yes, Hillary uh, is wonderful to be able to join us here uh, on the, the Zoom poetry as well. Uh, and thanks so much for having us. Um, I, I'll, I'll speak. It was very kind of you, a gracious introduction, Kathy, and, and I'll have the honor of also introducing my, my co-poetic author uh, that's going to share with me today, which also happens to be my PhD supervisor, uh, Professor Hillary Kremen who is the, the head of faculty at the University of Cambridge Faculty of Education, who is an incredible scholar, educator, and poet who brings a, an ethos of criticality and creativity into all the things that she has done over, over the decades of work she's done, making the world a more peaceful place, one classroom, one educational institution at a time. Um, and I've had the real privilege uh, of learning and, and working with Hillary over the past gosh, four years now. Um, and we have the opportunity today to, to share with you all uh, a poem that we recently co-wrote together. Um, I'll share a little bit about the context and then Hillary, if you wanna jump in before we read. Uh, the project was a, uh, a collaboration of 13 authors from, gosh, nine different countries, I think Canada, China, India, Malaysia, Philippines, South Africa, South Korea, the UK, and the US of peace education scholars from all those countries, an intergenerational group from some of the, the youngest scholars who are just working on or finishing their PhDs to the most senior uh, and most cited and acclaimed uh, scholars in the field coming together to reflect on what peace and coexistence in a more than human world looks like, reflecting on the intergenerational challenges that we face for education, for peace building, and specifically for climate action. And this, this chapter was a, a dialogue that went back and forth and went in many directions. And then Hillary and I were asked to write a poem, to read the whole dialogue, the whole chapter, and then to reflect through a, a poetic kind of parting gesture. Uh, and we, we haven't shared it with, with anyone, in fact, before until tonight. It's just been sent off to the publishers a few days ago, actually. And, and the poem that we wrote, Hilary, maybe if you want to introduce the, the the style of the poem and, and why we chose it before we jump in. Sure, yes. Thank you so much for welcoming me here, here today. I'm um, really, uh, I've really enjoyed the poetry that I've heard so far and looking forward to uh, to our first reading, actually, of, of, of this poem. So um, it draws on Louis McNeese's famous poem, uh, Prayer Before Birth, which is, which is one that I studied when I was 16 years old um, in, in, in school. And I've, I've loved it ever since. And there was something about the way the dialogue was going amongst the, the, the authors who were thinking about the future of, of peace education that called this particular poem to mind. And um, we thought we'd write uh, a sort of 21st century version uh, of the poem. As you, as you may know, the poem was written during the, the war years. 
um, and is written as a, a prayer of an unborn fetus thinking about the world that they're about to be born into. And um, some of the themes are, are similar, but some of the themes are new. Yeah, thanks, Hilary. And so, yeah, with that, we'll, we'll bring it, uh, we'll, we'll share the poem with you all. And and I guess, yeah, my last word would be is that it, it is both on the, the topic of, of climate crisis and climate justice, but it's also, I think, this poem and this project, this collaboration, this intergenerational global dialogue, this way of writing poetry together is also something that uh, I think speaks strongly to the themes that we're hearing in the poetry and in work to action as, as a movement itself. And so with that, we will share Prayer Before Birth to Louis McNeese more than 50 years on. I am not yet born, oh hear me. Let not the belching troll, nor the screeching war hawk, nor the bloody mouth propagandist come near me. I am not yet born, console me. I fear overspilling humans may burn or drown me. With virus or killing drones, finish me. With promotional lies, lure me. With artificial light and synthetic seeds, force feed me. I am not yet born, forgive me, for the crimes of commission, of omission, of co-option, that through me and the world shall enact, for the words of justice that speak me, for the thoughts of peace that think me, for the children that suffer, for the world that burns, and for me who, for I, that does not. I am not yet born, provide me, with water to dangle me, grass to grow for me, trees to talk to me, sky to sing to me, birds, and a white light in the back of my mind to guide me. I am not yet born, O oh, teacher, teach me, that I might navigate a world of burning bridges, of division and landscape scarred with barbed wire borders. O oh, show me that the structures around us are us, Teach me that they are also so far beyond us. Enable this paradoxical web of interconnection to render me infinitesimally small and grow me unfathomably powerful. I am not yet born, grace me, with fellow travelers whose words find my tongue to inspire, to disrupt, and to speak worlds into being. May their thoughts dwell in the deepest corners of my soul. Let not intelligent machines give birth to a new cold world before we find peace within our fragile human bodies. Let me be a vessel to expand the meaning of who and what matters. May I and my children flourish in this new way of being with one another before it's too late. Let them not take this prayer as hollow words. Let it be praxis and promise, a point of punctuation at the end of dialogue, signaling a perpetual new beginning. Thank you all so much for the, for the world premiere of the poem. Um, and yeah, a special thanks. Uh, I, again, I, I appreciate the opportunity to share the substance, but also the, the process of this poem and I know as a as a um, as as a younger scholar, as a younger activist, that I'm so inspired by the work of folks like Hillary, folks like you see here on the call, and the need for the intergenerational exchange of knowledge and wisdom and learning. And, and that I hope that this poem is is a testament to that path together. Thank you so much, Will. Thank you, Hillary, for joining us. This was a real treat. Uh, Home for two voices, I'm thrilled. Um, thank you. Next we have Tess Berry reading, if that's okay, Tess. <laughs> um, Tess is a widely published poet. She is a fellow of the Western Pennsylvania Writing Project and teaches at Carlow University in Pittsburgh, where she is the director of the MFA in Creative Writing Program. I think you'll see a lot of um, Carlo folks here. Um, it's a connecting thread for sure. Thank you, Tess. Uh, you're, you're muted. Tess, you're muted.
Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Happens. Thank all. you so much. Um, I just want to say what an honor and privilege it is to be here with Camille. Uh, that was such a beautiful reading. So sorry that you were ill, and I hope that you continue to feel uh, better and well. Uh, beautiful to hear Enda, who is a mentor in our MFA program at Carlo, which is a dual residency program that takes place in the U.S. and Ireland. So always great to hear Enda. Uh, Will and Hillary, that was absolutely beautiful. I absolutely love Louis McNeese. I love his work and return to it always. What a beautiful poem. So thank you, Kathy, for inviting uh, me to participate in 2020 and to come back and read today. Uh, I'm going to be reading a poem that came out of a prompt by the American poet Terence Hayes, uh, who is an incredible, beautiful poet. It was a rhetorical practices prompt. It's a very long and involved prompt based on a poem by Dean Young. Uh, anyone who's interested in the prompt, it's a great prompt for teaching um, and for writing something that you might not normally write. It got me out of my own sort of writing style. Um, I think it is a poem about clim climate. One of the elements of the prompt was to write about an insect. And I had recently received a postcard from a friend uh, in Europe of a hummingbird hawk moth which is something I had never seen before and which was truly terrifying to behold. Uh, and when I wrote the poem, it was a strange winter day that was very summer-like. And I was having a, a feeling of thinking about the power and mystery of the natural world and the sense of terror that sometimes overcomes me when I think about climate change and all the harm that's been done to the natural world. It's called February Sphinx. I'm not asking if you stayed sober or found your way to God. I was a grown woman and out of my parents' house virgin for Christ's sakes before I ever saw any man naked. My heart is telling you how much I wanted. Lady Day's gloomy Sunday plays as a bride, I carried a bouquet of gardenias. Days later, we carried their sticky sweet scent on our breath like a virus. Hummingbird hawk moss are often mistaken for hummingbirds. It's hard to tell them apart at a distance. They trace figure eight patterns by wing Eight's always been lucky for me. Did you know that? But what if I'm wrong? What if it's actually five, say, or nine? Hummingbird hawk moss, hawk moss fly faster than bats. 85 wing beats per second. They feed in bright daylight. From the genus of sphinx moth, as in Egyptian Sphinx, yes. How can any good come of this? Alicia Keys, please sit down and record Gloomy Sunday while there's still time. I was only dreaming, I wake and I find. Today the sky is February gray, but also summer blue. Today the sky is winter white, Spring-like, it's in the 70s, rainy, for Scythia is opening, snow arriving overnight. Evolution hovers, eyes in all directions. Its pupils only seem to focus. A hawk moss, straw-like nose, ghouls coloring, two opposable thumbs, beating featherless. Thank you. Thank you, Tess. So our next, I think I'll go back to, we can all react to Tess. Um, I'm going back to gallery mode because I don't know how to highlight myself because I'm the host. Anyway, um, I am also an alum 
uh, and I will read something I wrote during the retreat in 2020. Um, it's changed a little bit, but I think it speaks to the conversation I had with Camille. It's called Message for the Grandchildren I Don't Have Yet. At Jim Hansen's congressional testimony in 1988, he showed model projections of continued global warming, assuming further increases in human-produced greenhouse gases. I lived in a vacuum tube TV when I was your age. Scientists said the earth is warming, a linear relationship, carbon and temperature. When I was your age, global warming, greenhouse effect, carbon cycle and ozone hole, a new vernacular. When I was your age, they counted CO2 bubbles in glacial ice cores, plotted the industrial revolution. When I was your age, I danced in a music video. In historical correlation, they found facts. They said, we're wrecking the planet. When I was your age, only my great, great grandkids would see the storms, higher heat and rising coasts. When I was your age, I'd be long dead before we felt mass extinctions, deforestation, ocean, ocean acidification. I made mixtapes when I was your age. We talk stream pollution, habitat loss, litter and overfishing, gross inequalities and civil rights brutalities. When I was your age, we held cold hands in circles of votive candles and <clears throat> sharing words like peace and colorblind. When I was your age, we started to connect the points, the trajectory and arrow collecting hurricane energy. I partied into the sunrise when I was your age. We didn't witness it. We were too optimistic and too slow with our dot to dots. The picture appeared and we were standing hip deep in filthy floodwaters, digging out of mudslides slower than graves, dodging bullets, hiding from pandemics, masking our eyes against tear gas. We had loads of time when we had it to waste. Thank you. And ironic, uh, another coincidence that was inspired by a poem on Will's old podcast, Stories with a Heartbeat by Raif Saida. So next, we have our participants who will be joining us at the end of May. Anyone, we have more space if a few more want to join. Um, it's a week-long writing retreat in my home. And I host you, so I'm not writing so much as I'm taking care of my guests um, and it'll be a nice time. And then we do a public reading at a convent that is just below a, it's an old convent that's been converted into an educational center and it's just below a castle in Balsers. So next we have Jerry LeFeminum. Jerry writes poems and essays and fiction, teaches people and plays rock and roll. His new book of poems, After the War for Independence, is due out shortly. And since I was showing everyone else's books, I also have quite a few of Jerry's. He's also my mentor for life. Thank you. It's a lot of responsibility, Kathy. I know. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here. I'm very excited about May. Um, I'm going to read. Uh, I lived in Northern Michigan for about nine years. And um, it's amazing what they do with highways. Um, they don't really care where they put a highway. Um, and so they, uh, they put a highway right across the uh, breeding ground for snapping turtles, which strikes me as uh, part of this discussion. This is called Snapping Turtle. That season we called spring, the turtles would leave Houghton Lake to cross four lanes of highway toward the old spawning grounds, or try to. Occasional cars careening over their lost hubcap bodies, crushed carcasses lining the roadside. 
One afternoon, not wanting to give up belief in what's possible, I pulled onto the shoulder and lifted one. She was large, surprisingly heavy, and I hefted her toward the other side, arms outstretched as she stretched her neck right, then left, mouth biting at air, her claws scratching at nothingness, for she couldn't know I was trying to save her. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you very much. So if everyone could react to Jerry. Um, we're a little short on time, so we won't do two um, more facts. I'd like to move on to Doug Van Gundy, who writes poems and essays in Elkins, West Virginia, where he directs the Low Residency MFA program in creative writing at West Virginia Wesleyan College. His second book of poems is forthcoming from the University of Press of, University Press of Kentucky, a charm against forgetting. Doug plays fiddle, guitar, and mandolin in the old time music duo, Born Old. I'm looking forward to him bringing his fiddle to our campfire at the end of May. Thank you so much, Kathy. It's an honor to be here and to be uh, be welcomed into this community. And it's it's just been a real tonic to hear poems from, from all of you today. Um, it was 70 degrees in Elkins, West Virginia yesterday, and it snowed this morning. So uh, it's completely gray and dismal outside. And this was this really was. Uh... Oh, no. I'm... Did I freeze on you there? Yeah. OK. But the text came through. <laughs> OK. Um, so. Uh... I think it's really important. Uh, I just, many of you have touched on some of the things I wanted to say about writing poetry of action, eco poetry, um, and all the different kinds of uh, environments that we that we move through: the physical environment, the built environment, the natural environment, the political environment, the social environment. Um, and I think it's really important to look at what is actually around us. Um, and not what we expect to see. And uh, this poem is, is as much against the normalization of environmental degradation uh, as it is about the need for seeing what's in front of us. Uh, it's called Roaring Creek. There's an epigraph from Don West. Uh, I love the sad, solemn beauty in your mountains. I returned today to a favorite place, a deep water hole in a mountain creek. The stream in front of me dovetailed perfectly with my memory. Green, hidden beneath rhododendron and feathery hemlock. I wish you could go there with me, wade into your knees, wince at water that remembers last winter's snowfall handing the heat in your fingers and feet to the stream, turning all of the rocks in its lumpy bed. You wouldn't startle any minnows, nor find a single crawdad or caddis fly larva. The surface hasn't been dimpled by water striders for over 80 years, and the deep green holes that harbored lunker brook trout hold only last year's leaves and quartz pebbles turned orange with iron. Topo maps tell the tale. The headwaters of every stream in the quadrangle rise in old strip mines, fractured earth oozing acid drainage like a biblical curse, promising nothing will ever grow here again. Here, where I learned to swim. Here, where the water tastes as bloody as a punch in the mouth. Why hasn't the ruin occurred to me until now? And why? Only now does anger rise in my guts like poisoned water. Thank you, Doug. Oh, that was powerful. Uh, um, now I think I will share my screen again one last time and then we'll move into the open mic. And anyone can ask questions as we, as you have them, it, it, just speak up. 
if you have questions about word to action. I'm gonna move on quickly. This is the last one. And the conflicts are climate related as well. So there's more information at wordtoaction.com. And this is what where we have our campfire right over there to the left. So thank you. Any questions before we move to the open mic? Okay, first up, we have two readers. I um, We have Valerie Bakarak in Laboni Islam. Um, we will stop the recording after Valerie. Valerie, you're up. Oh, okay, sorry. I have to, you have to introduce yourself. I don't have my bio here, but that's, that's, that's all right. Valerie is um, a dear friend. Yes, Kathy and I became dear friends when we met at Carlo's MFA with Jerry LaFemina as our amazing mentor. And it was just the two of us with Jerry. So it was a pretty spectacular semester. And we're all still friends, which is even better. So I'm going to read a short poem thinking about how we as people often get in the way of nature. Um, and this happened uh, when my husband and I were on a vacation in Alaska. So this poem is called Misty Fjord, Alaska. We're in a boat watching a cormorant skim aquamarine water. It circles and circles, flies close to sheer granite cliffs where it hides among green plants, where in a nest eggs wait for warmth or nestlings for food. No one speaks, the boat bobs quietly, but this lone bird continues to fly in ever widening loops with its long neck and tiring wings. Perhaps it sees we are danger, some unknown barrier, yet doesn't give up, flies off, returns. And I think this must be devotion, love in its simplest form, a willingness to try again and again to reach its nest, to overcome exhaustion, find its way home. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. I'm going to turn off the 